Welcome to FRSC 1100. I'm your instructor, Adam Roberts. And even though this is not a live lecture, you can contact me anytime by email at aroberts at athenstech.edu or you can call me at 706-357-0160. Now it's very important that you still read the text even though you're listening to this lecture. Test quizzes come from both. So do not sub one for the other and vice versa. If you haven't already, please make sure you take time and read through the syllabus addendum completely as it outlines due dates, your end project, and other requirements for the course. While I'm taking a minute to talk about your end project, I want you to go ahead and start thinking about it. It is going to require you to interview a department that you would like to work at. Using the text as a guide, you can use the various chapters to guide your interview and presentation project. For example, you may want to go to Gwinnett County. In Gwinnett County, you could talk about the fire department services, their hiring process, what types of calls they run, maybe talk about their inspections bureau, or whatever the case may be. Feel free to look in the last week file folder of this course for a good example of a presentation. Okay, what do you say we go ahead and get started? Chapter 1, History of the Fire Service. In this chapter, you will learn about the evolution of firefighting in the United States and other countries. You will also be able to explain the history of early firefighting organizations. You'll be able to describe early fire vehicles, as well as describe early personal protective equipment. You will be able to understand the fire service traditions. And I would like to take a minute and say that we are full of traditions in the fire service. Some good, uh, some not so good, as you'll discover throughout your class, as well as throughout your experiences in the fire service. You'll be able to describe the origins of fire facilities, explain the US fire dilemma and its causes, and discuss the changing role of the modern firefighter. The ability to control fire was an important factor in forming early communities. And ever since the dawn of time, humans began appreciating fire and its potential for use. And the ability to control fire was an important factor in forming these communities where initially you look at the caveman error, you have humans that fear fire and now they start learning to control it and to respect it. Key word definition that you need to know is fire science is the field of studying various disciplines associated with fire. With the history of the fire service in this text, it's important to know that this curriculum includes topics such as protective systems, building construction, fire codes and ordinances, as well as a little bit about fire behavior. So this text and this class is going to give you a good overview of all the subjects that we're going to cover in the degree and diploma program. So this will give you a good idea of what part of the fire science community you may enjoy more. Maybe instead of fire fighting, you may be more into arson investigations or inspection. Uh, it'll also cover things that'll help you be a better firefighter. So let's look at the evolution of the firefighting service. 
The earliest beginning of the firefighting efforts were found it within the Roman Republic. And in the first century BC, the city of Rome was subjected to conflagrations. And conflagrations is a term that basically means large fires that consumed a lot of buildings, materials, and things of that nature. Some of the largest conflagrations in history, and we'll talk about a few of these later on, would be uh, Rome, obviously, as well as uh, London in Great Britain. So the Romans were aware that fire, obviously, is very damaging in terms of the community. So the Romans decided, hey, we need to do something to help combat this growing uh, fire epidemic they were having. So the Romans decided to form the first fire brigades. And they were originally slaves, because at that time, you got to think, there were no protective equipment for people to wear uh, going in fires. No respirators, no coats, things of that nature. A lot of the firefighting was done as bucket brigades and brooms and dirt and things of that nature. So it was a very, very dangerous occupation. So you really didn't have a lot of people that would uh, volunteer uh, to go fight fire. So that's why the Romans used slaves uh, to fight the fire. And they started it with 600 public slaves and that is known as the Familia Publicia, and that's something that would behoove you to remember. So again, the first Roman firefighters were slaves, and they were known as the Familia Publicia, and they were tasked with the protection of Rome. And they were also tasked with uh, alerting the public in the event of a fire. Well, this didn't last too terribly long because they found that slaves, how they were great in terms of, you know, forcing them to go fight a fire, but they weren't too uh, hip on the idea, so um, they weren't very aggressive in, in terms of trying to put the fire out. You know, why would I put something out that uh, doesn't belong to me, so to speak? So in approximately 6 AD, Emperor Augustus organized freedmen to form this fire brigade and they were called vigils to patrol the streets. So it's important you remember that the freemen that were firefighters in Rome were the vigils and the predecessors to that were the slaves and they were known as the Familia Publicia. The vigils would fight fire with buckets, obviously, that they would throw water on from uh, whatever water source they had, and poles with hooks on them. And some of that may be where we get the term hook and ladder today, but the hooks were used to pull down walls or mainly the roofs of the structures that were on fire to try to keep the fire from spreading. And a lot of times, they wouldn't worry about the structure that was on fire. Uh, they kind of wrote that off. They were more worried about keeping the fire from spreading to the other buildings. So they would put water on the surrounding buildings and try to pull the roof off of it to keep it from burning. And in 64 AD, a conflagration destroyed two-thirds of the city of Rome. At the time, you had Emperor Nero, and one of the debates in history is that Nero, the emperor, played his violin as Rome burned. And in some other texts I've read, they kind of paint Nero as somebody that saw that there was a problem with the design of the city. And rather than try to put the fire out, he let it burn so he could rebuild the city in a more uh, productive or better fire safe manner. Uh, changing building codes, so to speak, with different roof styles, uh, spreading buildings further apart, and things of that nature. That way the fire, if it ever happened again, would not destroy the entire city. In 
in history, there's another great ruler, William the Conqueror of England, which instituted the first fire prevention activities to prevent fire. And here's something uh, for you guys to sound smart about, or a trivia question if you're ever on Jeopardy. And he came up with basically fire marshals that would walk the streets of London, and at nightfall, around 8 o'clock, would tell people to put their fires out because they would see the uh, fires from cooking, warming, or whatever the case may be, coming up from the chimneys, the smoke. So he would go around and say, cover de feu, which translates into modern times as curfew. But cover de feu basically meant you covered the flu of your fireplace to put the fire out. So, you know, you wouldn't be smoking out the residents. So this was their way to try to help prevent fire. And there's a great video that I want you guys to watch. It's also in this lesson that talks about um, the London fire and the history of the fire service. But when you look at the London fire, you'll look at the fact that how close the buildings were. And because the buildings were so close together, once the fire got a good headway and got going, it it was unstoppable. And, and literally, it burnt, you know, streets after street after street of, of buildings and churches and everything else. Because London was built in stages. So you had the older section in the center and then when the next generation would come along or more people then they would start building around the original settlement. So you had varying degrees of the city. And in that inner city is where this fire started. And it said it burned for four days and consumed 430 acres, 13,000 homes, and 89 churches. And the city kind of like um, Rome, after they burned up all the, uh, the original stuff, uh, said, hey, you know what, uh, one of the problems we learned from this fire is that, you know what, we need wider streets to spread these buildings apart and replace all these wooden structures with brick. Because guess what, you know, brick don't burn. And change the uh, pitch for the building roofs to help control the spread of the fire. One thing that was kind of interesting, after this fire, there were countless numbers of people that lost everything, their business, their homes, everything, and they were flat broke. So one thing they came up with after the Great London Fire was uh, the first actual insurance company. And the insurance office was tasked with helping people like today um, get back on their feet. The company not only insured the property, but actually also took responsibility for actual firefighting. So the insurance company, again, would take money from people and provide a policy. And if your place burned down, then they were required to pay you back a certain amount. And, of course, they didn't want to part with their money. So they started finding ways to uh, prevent fires and put, uh, keep the fires from spreading and, of course, put the fires out, uh, which is kind of true today in, in terms of what has driven uh, laws and regulations. A lot of it is not really so much the government driven but or the community but the actual insurance agencies so to kind of help make it easy to identify who had insurance and who didn't they started the concept of fire marks which were placed on the building to identify which properties were protected and by whom and each insurance company had their own fire brigade so to speak uh, put the fires out. So it kind of dictate this home was protected by this fire station, so to speak, or this group of people. 
and here is a great photo of one. Uh, German town, 1843, of course, shaking hands, mutual fire. And that was the actual symbol or the marker that they would place on the side of the building so they knew if it was ever on fire, this was who would come to put the fire out. An interesting fact to note, in 1631, a fire in Boston resulted in the ban of wooden chimneys and thatched roofs. Again, we had a fire, or they had a fire, I should say. Uh, it, it was linked to the chimney catching on fire that was made of wood, which spread to the roof. So that, again, kind of helped dictate uh, the policies to try to keep it from moving forward. In the United States, it's interesting to note that colonial law required each house to have a bucket on its front step to be used by the bucket brigade. And in 1648, New York City, known then as New Amsterdam, created uh, volunteer fire wardens. And these fire wardens would, you know, like uh, the vigils before, would patrol the streets and try to alert people of fire and get people out of bed and get folks out there to put the fire out. With fires beginning to pop up so often, Boston decided that, hey, you know what? In 1679, we need somebody to do this full time to put the fire out. Because they, of course, I guess we're, we're uh, having trouble with, um, you know, volunteers and, and paid folks, things of that nature. So in 1679, Boston established the first paid firefighters. Here's a great picture of the first rattle that was used to alert towns of an emergency that the uh, fire wardens would carry. And of course it would make a you know, clicking, clapping sound as they would swing it around. In 1736, Benjamin Franklin established the first volunteer fire company in Philadelphia. And it really became a, a prestige thing where it was a social club and these were pillars of the community and, and they would get together and they would, you know, talk shop and, and you know, of course, fight fire and, and be the stewards of the community. There were long wait lists of people that wanted to volunteer. And here's a picture of Benjamin Franklin wearing a fire helmet. And he's kind of credited with being a founder for modern firefighters, uh, excuse me, modern firefighting. And of course, heading up the volunteers. And volunteers have a long tradition in the fire service, whether it be from, you know, small towns to Pennsylvania, up north to, you know, south Georgia. Uh, volunteers are, are still being used today in a lot of communities where uh, they maybe not have a lot of fire or um, it's a small community and they can't afford to uh, pay people full time uh, to be firefighters. So uh, my hat's off to folks that volunteer to be firefighters. Unfortunately, it seems that with current trends that uh, the volunteers are harder and harder to find. Uh, the requirements for training are getting more and more um, stringent. So I don't know what's going to happen with volunteers in America. But I do know right now they currently are on the decline. Insurance companies and fire departments in the United States were, were kind of like the Wild West when it came to these early fires because you had certain fire companies that would try to get there first and, and put a fire out so they could in turn get the money from the insurance company. So you had these different fire groups competing with one another to see who could get there first and put the fire out. And another thing that they would do is try to sabotage people uh, in the other groups. So this is kind of where the history of the wooden fire plug comes in. And basically back then, you would have a wooden pipe, if you will, that would run the streets. And you had a plug spot where you would 
open up the water line and you would put in uh, the hand pumps to get fire out, uh, get water out to put the fire out of course they would send people ahead of them to hide these wooden lines you know they would put you know buckets over the fire plug or, or sit on them to try to prevent the other companies from putting the fire out till their folks got there I hate to say, it's kind of funny, but there were actually fights would break out between the varying fire companies on, on who was going to put the fire out. So here they're having a throw down in the street while the home is, uh, of course, burning. Moving forward in history with our equipment from the hand pump, and there's a great video again on that. Uh, a clip in that video about the hand pumps. Uh, after that came the first steam pumps and the steam pumps were basically coal or wood fired and it used steam to help pull the water out of the pipes and apply a stream with greater reach to help put the fire out. And the early steam pumpers were used in the 1800s and they were pulled by the horses, the horse-driven uh, uh, pumpers. And they didn't become motorized until the 1900 years, and of course with motorized pumps. But in the fire service, I think we resist change, and we just don't like it. And this is shown throughout the history of the fire service, and this is an excellent example. Uh, many of the fire departments were less than receptive to using the steam power pumps. Uh, reason being that the, the pumps that they had that were powered by man were also pulled by man. Uh, so they saw it as threatening the amount of volunteers or firefighters they would need because you wouldn't need as many because the machine or the horses were doing the job. So there was a lot of resistance to it, but eventually they would come around and then the horses came very prevalent. And this is the time in our history where you would see these horse-drawn fire pumpers and they were very ornamental. They were decked out, brass, shiny, quite a, a, a spectral to be seen, I'm sure. And in the 1800s, gave way to the 1900s where the motorized era came into play. And again, the fire service was very apprehensive to switching over to these motorized vehicles. You know, again, they saw it as a threat. Uh, they were happy with their horses. And in fact, if there weren't for the fact that a horse flew went through the United States killing a large number of horses, they probably would not have gone to them. And of course, with the horse era, you had the Dalmatians, and the Dalmatians were found to be a great source of comfort to the horses where they would look after them and protect them as well as make noise and of course uh, bark and go behind them to alert people the coming fires. Uh, there's a great video and I'll see if I can find it and post it later on the site of uh, horse drawn pumpers where the horses were trained when they would hear that bell or that tone that they would literally get out of their stalls and back their self up to the steamers to be ready to get hitched up and go. Uh, there's actually, uh, in the video, if I'm not mistaken, um, they have a brass hoof, horse hoof, that, I, I forget exactly what city it was in, but this was a monument to a horse, of course, that had to be put down, because it ran all the way to the fire and broke its hoof off and, and still managed to do its job. Moving forward, really the true professional firefighter was not a reality until the 19th century, uh, where you had the full-time paid departments, multiple stations, things of that nature, and um, even today, according to the text, 87% of firefighters are volunteer. 
And as I said, uh, I know they are really hurting for folks. Some other noteworthy stuff, the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation and ISO. The National Firefighter Foundation is a foundation in Emmitsburg, Maryland that uh, helps families and memorialize uh, firefighters who died in line of duty. And another good example of modern day insurance slash firefighting uh, groups working together is ISO or the Insurance Service Offices and Ratings. And basically what they do is they set a number and this number dictates what insurance companies should charge businesses and families and residents in that area for insurance uh, against fire and basically what they do is they go in and they look at water supply fire trucks manpower things of that nature and it's a mathematical formula and they come up with a rating so the better your fire service the lower your insurance is going to be and the higher the number is because a one is the best uh, a 10 is uh, virtually no fire coverage whatsoever so again the lower the number the less uh, your folks are going to pay Here's a great photo of an early volunteer fire company with station equipment in the late 1800s. Again, notice how ornamental they are, decorative. Here is a picture of the National Fallen Firefighters Memorial in Emmitsburg, Maryland, where the names of firefighters that have fallen in the line of duty are displayed, and they have a ceremony once a year honoring the fallen firefighters. So with every fire pump, you have to have a hose, right, to get the water to the fire. So in 1672, Dutch inventor Jean van der Heiden, and I'm sure I said that wrong, developed the first fire hose. And it's kind of interesting, with the hose, the diameters that he came up with are still used today. And in 1679, Boston imported his first fire engine uh, to the Americas. And in 1743, the first American built fire pump was produced by Thomas Lote of New York. Of course, the first fire pump that was imported could only pump 30 to 40 tons of water per hour and that's kind of interesting because you look at it today the modern fire pump you're, you're pumping about 1500 to a thousand gallons per minute so how far we have come here's a picture of old Silsby steam engine here that's again the horse drawn and notice the the bright brass in 1907 American built internal combustion fire engines uh, appeared and the earlier versions were either pumping engines or tractors to pull the fire equipment so they basically kind of took what they had and tried to make it in something that would fight fire. And really that tradition, I think, still remains today. You, you look at what you have and you try to make something that work to fight fire. And in some volunteer fire departments, you have these homemade tenders or tankers, uh, which are pieces of fire equipment that carry large amounts of water. And they don't per se use active firefighting. You, you don't pull hoses off of them. They're used to supply the fire engines and with these homemade tankers or tenders they, they find something that will hold water they belt it uh, welded or bolted to a frame of a truck and they drive it around which does the job unfortunately it's lacking some of the technology to make it safe so it, inside these homemade uh, tenders they're missing what are called baffles and baffles are compartments or walls they keep the water from splashing around so much that can cause 
the weight center of gravity to shift and the vehicles roll. In the early 19th century, saw the additions of the horse-drawn fire wagons, as we said, and the era lasted about 100 years. A great picture of a horse pulling a large hook and ladder truck. Here are some more important dates to remember about the history of the fire service. In 1853, the first U.S. steam-powered fire engine constructed in Cincinnati rolled off the line. 1910, those two functions were combined to both move the apparatus and pump the water. And in 1923, the Chicago Fire Department became the first completely motorized fire department in the U.S. And when we look at the, the history of the fire engine, does anybody know why it was chosen to be red? Yeah, another trivia question here for you. And that's because at the time, Henry Ford, which obviously was the inventor of the Model T Ford, and he streamlined the whole construction process with the assembly line, said you could have a Ford in any color you wanted as long as it was black. So when they started to come out with the fire engines, they decided, hey, what would stand out the most to be seen so people could get out of the way in a sea of black vehicles? And it was determined that red would be the best color. So that's how kind of uh, red fire trucks came about. Uh, if you want a funny joke, uh, ask Siri why are fire trucks red and see what that gets you. When you look at fire vehicles today, they have changed uh, not only to be built for solely firefighting, but other specialized tasks, such as an aerial or a ladder. And those are you know, designed, of course, to put up uh, an elevate mass stream or rescue people from multi-story buildings. You have squads or rescue vehicles, which they don't carry fire pumps on or ladders, but maybe extrication equipment designed to get people out of cars, uh, cut them up, things of that nature. You have other specialty vehicles that are designed solely for hazmat instances, where they carry gas monitors and, and chemical things and such. So another important piece of equipment in modern firefighting was respiratory protection. They learned long ago that, of course, smoke and the superheated gases don't go well with trying to put the fire out and, of course, breathe at the same time. And in the Victorian era, firefighters, they used their beards to protect them from the smoke and the particles. They would dip their beards in water and kind of uh, put it in their teeth and mouth and kind of use that as a filter so they could, quote, filter breathe to be able to do their job and get close to the heat. And that's kind of ironic today when uh, our new mask, the SCBA, self-contained breathing apparatuses, you have to be clean shaven. So how far we have come from full beards to clean shaving and the reason why. In 1825, the first protective mask, the French apparatus Aldinia, was tested in fire conditions and was proven to be somewhat successful. And in 1870, fire department began using the Neely smoke excluding mask, which again was another way to keep the smoke out and allow it to filter out the, the particles so people could operate in the smoky conditions and fight the fire. In the early 20th century, the first self-contained breathing apparatus, which stands for SCBA, was known as the Gibbs, came into use. Uh, some of the problems with the, uh, the air pack was it was extremely heavy and cumbersome. And eventually, you know, this gives way to our more uh, modern fire packs that are, are, are carbon fiber composites that are a lot lighter than uh, the predecessors were the aluminum and steel tanks. So we have come a long way. Um, our gear is heavy enough without adding a, a big heavy steel cylinder. So they're a lot lighter. And with the event of the positive pressure system, it keeps 
the smoke and the particles out. So basically what you have is a tank on your back filled with compressed air. And every time you take a breath in, it creates a negative pressure allowing some of that air to come out. So you exhale and it forces the air out of the sides of the mask, which doesn't allow anything to come in. And when you inhale, the mask sucks to your face, again, creating that negative pressure that brings that fresh air in. So a little different, uh, but same uh, in terms of a, an SC, uh, not an SCBA, a scuba diving equipment. So again, looking back at our facilities, our buildings that fire fighters had for a fire station. Your early volunteer air equipment was basically stored in a shed. Uh, there wasn't anything um, to sleep or eat like today. Um, basically, as that social club mentality still endures and people began staying at these areas or buildings for overnight periods or longer periods of time, it became the need to add in sleeping quarters and place to store equipment as well as places to take showers and eat and bathe. So your fire hall basically turned into a, a home. And that's really what it is in, in today's standards is it's a place where people go to live for, you know, 24 hours while they protect the community and, and do their other task. So let's talk a little bit about the symbolism in the fire department. We know a bit about the insignia on the buildings that dictate why, um, or I shouldn't say uh, why, but you know, whose property that was. And with the evolution of the fire service, we kind of adopted that symbol saying, okay, well, this is our fire company or this is our engine. So within many departments, even though there are one fire department, you have station one, station two, engine company three, ladder four, whatever the case may be. And their own little individual engine groups here, those fire stations came up with their own badges and symbols. Uh, to make them stand out from everyone else. And of course, we talked about why the uh, fire engines were red. Another interesting symbol is the Maltese Cross. And the Maltese Cross goes back to Malta. And here's some pictures of some badges. And if you see this one here on the far right that says Texas Engineering, and let's see if I can't draw an arrow here. That is a good picture of a Maltese cross, and the Maltese cross dates back to um, the Crusades, you know, medieval knights, and they were from the island of, uh, or excuse me, uh, they were an order of knights, you know, fighting on the Crusades, and this particular group of knights used this cross as a symbol and some of their brethren soldiers were trying to storm a castle or something of that nature and they ca were caught on fire by them dumping the defenders that is um, hot oil onto them below and then of course lighting them off the flaming area well these knights rushed in to save their fallen comrades and pulled them from the fire and pull them out. And on their way back from the Crusades, they stopped at the island of Malta and made a hospital for these folks because these individuals were burnt pretty bad and they, they couldn't make the trip back. So the Maltese Cross kind of dates back to that island in Malta where these knights uh, risk you know, life and limb to charge into the fire to save their fellow man. And that symbol has endured ever since. And really, that's what we still do today, in essence. You know, we risk our lives to go and save people, their property, their belongings. And, of course, we talked about the symbolism in the other slide already of the Dalmatian. Even better picture of a Maltese cross here for you. And see how the cross also detects other symbols on this particular one. You have on the 
left side here, a picture of the hook and ladder from early days, uh, you know, where they were pulling roofs out and walls down. You have, of course, the fire hydrant. You have the fire engine. And in the center, we have a picture of a fire helmet. We have a picture of a hook. We have a picture of a ladder. There's your hook. There's your ladder. We have a picture of an axe, all tools that we use. And the other big symbol, the bugles, the fire bugles. And this again dates back to the horse drawn error errors and the uh, horse drawn error with the uh, pumps as well as the hand drawn pumps in terms of they would blow these horns and rattles and have the dogs bark to alert people that they were coming and help was on the way and to clear the streets and make way. So we still hold on to our history and our tradition, and you can go to most any fire hall, and you'll see pictures of the men and women who have served before. There's a lot of times pictures of fires they've been on, uh, crews uh, from past that have retired, and a lot of fire departments still today have you know yearly Christmas meetings where the retirees come back and visit, and everyone gets together sings Kumbaya, or whatever the case may be, uh, in terms of their tradition. I personally think this, this part of the text is a little dated. I, I think we've done a little bit better, but one thing is true, though. We do lag way behind others, especially in Europe, in terms of firefighting equipment and uh, firefighting tactics and techniques and laws. Uh, if you think about it, though, they've been fighting fire from the Dark Ages and, you know, us, not so much. And here's some examples in terms of property loss and, of course, equipment and, and things of that nature that's been used to fight fire. One thing that they equated the fire problem to was a report um, called America Burning and American Burning Revisited in 1987, but it basically showed an attitude problem in, in the early 70s where, yeah, yeah, fire, yeah, it can happen, but, you know, it, it, it can't happen to me. It was a very careless uh, mentality. Uh, you know, people smoking cigarettes in bed and catching the bed on fire themselves in the house and things of that nature. So we were not a very fire-wise community. So the result of these uh, groundbreaking, and I say groundbreaking because at the time they were, um, papers and studies showed that the fire service, we needed to adapt and change what we were doing. We were doing a pretty good job of putting fires out. But what if we started preventing the fires? So that's when we started getting in the education business, you know, uh, the friendly firefighter going to the school, uh, the station visits, stop, drop, and roll, things of that nature to help prevent fires from even occurring. In 2001, it showed again where, hey, uh, the fire service kind of has to change our, our mission of what we do, not only are we doing firefighting and education, but as a result of the terror attacks, uh, you have more emergency management functions in terms of what do we do in the event of a terrorist attack, uh, in terms of mitigating or minimizing the situation, you know, treating patients, setting up shelters, and, and things of that nature, and that's a direct result of the Patriot Act. And of course, it established uh, the Department of Homeland Security, and that kind of has helped dictate our, our policy on it and implementation of uh, emergency management type functions. And a lot of fire departments also function as emergency management uh, entities. Sometimes it's the sheriff department, sometimes it's a, a separate group altogether.
So as history has shown, firefighters today are no longer a single role provider. And to me, it seems like if you, you don't know who to call uh, when you call 911 or who to send, it, it seems like they always send out the fire department. So we're kind of a jack of all trades, and I like to say a master of none. You have some departments where they do double and triple roles, uh, depending on the size of the community. And what I mean by that is EMS has really, or emerging medical services, the ambulance folks, ha has really found a niche in the fire service. You have a lot of fire services that also handle the ambulance side of things and emergency medicine. And when you look back uh, in the 70s, in modern America, there was a show that came on that just really piqued the interest of the American public in terms of, hey, um, what my fire department can do to help me. And that was the show Emergency. Feel free to Google it. There are great YouTube uh, videos on it. It was an old show where um, Johnny DeSoto and Roy Cage were these two firefighters and California that became paramedics and of course they would always save the day and you know bring somebody back to life and, and run in the burning building and all that kind of stuff so it kind of introduced the concept that hey when I have a medical emergency you know I, I think I should call of course you know our emergency number and you know the fire department comes out and now they and, and they help so that started making us get training toward EMS and in, in the early years in the history of EMS uh, when you need an ambulance, a lot of times you got the Hearst because uh, that was capable of transporting, you know, patients to the hospital and the attendants had very little if no training whatsoever. And I've heard stories, uh, you know, of back in the day, I'm dating myself a little, where, you know, hearses would show up on an accident scene and they would fight over the dead people as opposed to try to take the living people to the hospital because apparently I guess that they, they, they figured they would get more money for doing the funeral uh, and the embalmment and all that as opposed to taking a person to the hospital so that kind of showed where you know fire service said hey you know we need to start you know changing our our focus a little bit and start doing something else so that's when we kind of got in the EMS business and sometimes today you have EMS that it's its own separate entity and you have others that are still under the uh, fire service umbrella. Um, I can't think of any locally in terms that do fire, EMS, and police, and that's what they talk about, the triple roles. Um, the City of Social Circle a long time ago used to have the police department that were also firefighters and they had to know a little bit about EMS as well. Of course, the ambulance service was run by um, a third county service. So that's just a, a good example there of how we all can wear different hats. Um, with the baby boomers and certain generations getting older and our building materials becoming less flammable and the introduction of sprinkler systems into residential structures and everything else, the amount of fires we fight are, are dropping significantly each year, but our EMS calls are going up. So, you know, take it what you will. Uh, in today's business world or model, if you think about it, if you provide a service and nobody uses it, you need to start finding other services to provide that they do need. Otherwise, you're gonna go out of business. Another concept will go more in depth later on in another chapter, but it talks about presidential directive mandate number five, which created NIMS or National Incident Management System, uh, which is a way for all of us to kind of work together and speak a common language. Uh, I don't want to go too much into that now, but uh, just kind of know that definition for, for this week anyway, and then we'll go more into it later on in the course. Uh, modern fire emergency services embrace standards and established during uh, an annual FESHI conference. And FESHI is basically a standard for higher education, uh, Fire Educational Services Higher Education Act. And that creates a curriculum, which the curriculum you're currently taking now is modeled after, that says, okay, if your program is FESHI approved, 
and you take it in California, then it should be the same in Georgia. So let's say you take half classes in California, well, they should all transfer over to Georgia. And uh, this last bullet point here, as I said, a majority of emergency calls are medical in nature and uh, not really fire. So that shows how our call volume has shifted. Um, I would say about 80% now are EMS related as opposed to the 20% fireside. Okay, so here's our summary. Feel free to read through it. Again, if you guys have any questions, you can contact me at aroberts at athenstech.edu by email, or you can call my office, or you can look in Blackboard, and there's a calendar, and in that calendar, I'll list dates and times that I'll be available in Blackboard Collaborate, which is like a virtual classroom. So you could log in there from work, home, whatever the case, and we can... Uh, discuss topics, I can answer questions, or whatever the case uh, you may be. So uh, you're not out there all alone by yourself. So feel free to go ahead and do the review questions for Chapter 1. No, you still have Chapter 2 to go over if you haven't done already. Uh, read the syllabus and make sure you watch that history video about the fire service. That covers a lot of the topics that we covered in the chapter as well as um, some additional ones and goes in a little more depth. Remember, anything that we cover, whether it be video, lecture, textbook, or slide is fair game when it comes to quizzes, tests, and finals. So again, I hope you guys enjoyed watching this and listen to it and have a good day.